um, like to call to order uh, the Village of Lake Bluff Sustainability and Community Enhancement Ad Hoc Committee regular meeting for Tuesday, September 19th, 2023. Can I get a uh, roll call? Call it roll, roll call. Yeah. Member Buccio? Present. Member Cole? Present. Member Hans? Present. Member Richard? Present. Member Twishell? Here. And Chair Renner? Here. Okay, um, first up is the consideration of the June 20th, 2023 regular meeting minutes. Does anyone have any corrections, comments, additions? Um, on page two, the last line, it's in bold. It's just nice and empty. Okay. Thank you. You said page two, the last. Here. Here we go. Involved. I see it. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Any, anything else? If not, uh, can I get a motion to approve? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. All right. Um, next up, we have um, allowed 15 minutes for non-agenda items for any visitors who want to speak on something that's not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone in the audience who wants to speak on something not on the agenda? Okay. Uh, then we'll move on to um, general business. Uh, take us forward. Yeah, so our first item is a Rabin presentation by Dave Kraft of Hay and Associates. And just so everyone knows, we're having a little bit of technical difficulty tonight. So uh, we don't currently have anyone on Zoom, but this is one of the ways that we record our meetings. So uh, if everyone can just kind of speak up speak loudly so that we get it recorded, that would be wonderful. And Drew, if you want to start uh, the presentation. Do you want me to just kind of let him know when to move forward? Yeah. There's a, I got a couple, I asked just because there's a couple animation things in there just with some of the slides. So. Okay, yeah. Um, it should play out just fine. So thanks for having me, everybody. My name is Dave Kraft. Um, I'm a principal engineer at Hay & Associates. Um, our firm is, you know, really, the, all of our work is focused on water and natural resources projects. Um, we're engineers and ecologists and environmental scientists, but I think as the community of Lake Bluff has seen, water tends to drive a lot of issues we have in a lot of design things, and that's really the focus of our firm. Uh, one of the things that we've done a lot of um, with that, you know, with that focus is work on ravines, including in the village of Lake Bluff and really all up and down the Lake Michigan coast and some inland ravines as well. So that's what we're here today to talk about. Uh, for, for these kind of presentations, you know, a little bit higher level things, kind of lean a little bit on definitions from Wikipedia because if you're all sitting around a fire and wondering what the ravine in back is, it's the first thing you do is plug your phone and see. And for a ravine, it actually gave what I thought was a pretty good definition. Um, as it relates to how we look at things from a design and restoration perspective. So you can see the definition there. A ravine is generally a fluvial slope landform of relatively steep cross-sectional sides on the order of 20 to 70% in gradient. Ravines may or may not have active streams flowing along the downslope channel, which originally formed them. Moreover, often they are characterized by intermittent streams since their geographic scale may not sufficiently large to support perennial water course. What does that mean? Fluvial, you know, basically means it's, it's a river form. It's a, it's a form of stream or river. And what this gets to, you know, really in the heart of this definition, which will be important to, you know, how we look at ravines, how they form, and some of the other things we'll talk about, is they tend to be very steep systems, um, meaning, you know, compared to the displays or the scope or something, the gradient, the, the steepness of that system is very high, which leads to a lot of the erosion we see. And, and as it notes here, we don't always see a river in the bottom. Sometimes it's just a, a water course that carries water during a storm event, which is um, often you know, what we see both in Lake Bluff and up and down you know, the, the Lake Michigan coast. So, um, with this presentation, you know, um, and talking to Claire a little bit, looking at what we did, really want to kind of start at high level, a little bit of process and function. How did these ravines form? How did they come, you know, come to be in this landscape? Um, some of the issues and failure points that we've seen historically in these ravine systems, and then look at some solutions and restoration approaches that you know we and others you know in the region use to approach that. 
Then we'll kind of look at a couple things we've done on Lake Club. I also try to throw one of my kids in there, so that's my daughter playing there. <laughs> um, so again, ravine formation, without getting really deep into it, you know, these are glacial features, you know, essentially. And, uh, these are a couple of images from the Lake Michigan Watershed Base Plan that the Lake County Stormwater Management Commission is just wrapping up this year. Um, I put the link in the presentation that I'm assuming will be available. It's a really interesting document. Um, you know, these watershed based plans really focus on a watershed level and look at issues related to water quality and those, you know, those types of things in individual watersheds. The Lake Michigan watershed have been sort of absent in our area for that, so Lake County Stormwater has been looking at um, providing a watershed plan aimed at Lake Michigan in Lake County in particular. Uh, again, these images really show some of the glaciation that's happened over, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years even in our area. And, you know, what I point out in here, we've got a blue, oh, hold on, Drew. <laughs> so what I point out in here is we've got a blue and a red dot on there. Our glaciers kind of came from the east and the northeast. And, you know, think of a glacier as this mile-high chunk of ice that was almost like a snowplow and made these, these moraines, we call them, on the end, which essentially is just a raising of the land. And as you can imagine, as those receded, that land was draining back towards the glacier as it receded, and that's where we've seen a lot of our ravines forms, which we'll get to in a second on a couple other images. So now you can go through. Um, so, you know, when we look at when we look at how rivers in particular form, you know, in all of their different iterations, including a ravine, you know, we look at, you know, what's been developed is called this channel evolution model. And you can see this typical river valley that we see, and that may be something like, you know, the original formation of the displays with these nice meandering channels and a floodplain and all these things we've heard about as we look at sustainability. Give it one more clip through, there's a, you know, there's a <coughs> animation that comes through here. So, what it basically it says on the on the right side of this channel evolution model is rivers are what we call you know, you know seeking dynamic equilibrium. You know what they're trying to do is over time they move sediment and water and they move through this process over the course of again hundreds of thousands of years where they where they erode and form these tight channels and then eventually that collapses in and creates the floodplain. Well, in a lot of cases, ravines very specifically as we've built around them. You know, we've kind of gotten stuck in this spot in the middle here where, you know, where it says incision there. The ravine's kind of cutting down and creating a very high velocity system that tends to be very erosive. I think you can all, anyone who's walked over any of the bridges or been down in the ravines, you know, that incision, um, you know, you know, um, you know, stage two in this model, or in, the, in the exhibit here, kind of shows you where we're stuck on a lot of these ravines. So, okay, go ahead. So with that channel evolution model, there's another principle when we look at, um, you know, again, channel evolution called Lane's balance. It's the guy who you know, thought of it, you know, 50, 60 years ago. And what it is, and this is a really good representation of it, is it's sort of the scale of um, how much water and how steep a system is versus what size of the material moves in it. And so when we get a steep system, so you push that, you know, the, the, the fish there, you push to the right and the system steepens up. You need bigger and bigger material to be stable in that system. So that picture on the right is actually down at the at the um, Green Nature Preserve, Lake Forest Open Lands parcel there. I thought it was a really good example of that ravine system where it's still holding that natural channel form. You can see those meanders in there, which is how water wants to move. But because those are finer grained clay sediments that were placed there by the glacier, they're eroding very aggressively because the system's too st steep for those smaller grain materials to be stable. Again, a lot of water, moving material, and it's not big enough to hold in place. And you know, that's just kind of the nature of these ravines in particular. So, all right. So that just shows, again, steeper, we need coarser material. That's why a lot of times we need things like rock to make sure that the project's gonna work, so. All right, so this is, um, this is this is a watershed map that you know, we did going back to the Ravine Park project so a decade ago or so now. And I just want to kind of point out that this obviously, you know, each of those lines, you know, the little spider web on here, those are two foot contour intervals. So you can see what, what reflects on here is these ravines are really deep systems. I'm sure you've all kind of seen this either driving around or on an aerial photograph or topographic map or something. The other thing that you get is as you get you know moving west there. 
that western boundary, and it doesn't show up right here, but that red line there is essentially our watershed boundary. That's kind of that end moraine we look at where you see it's not far in from shore, but basically this, you know, this pushed up there that creates that high point and then everything's draining back towards the lake. Um, as we see in the next couple of slides, we've taken advantage of those kinds of things as we've developed and worked through it. Um, th this is a, um, some information on the ravines and lake bluff in particular. Uh, this is an associated ArcGIS or, or online mapping application. Um, and again, the link is, is in it here. You can play around with that. But this is associated with that watershed base plan and essentially identifies all the ravine systems, um, you know, really up and down, even into Cook County as part of this watershed base plan. And then they went in and did an assessment. So the picture on the right is sort of a zoom out of Lake Bluff getting down into Lake Forest and you know, identifies some of the ravines I'm sure you're familiar with in town here. Uh, and then what we see on the left is as you zoom more in in this application, um, 2017 through 2019, Lake County Stormwater as part of this did an assessment of all of the ravines in the county. And so as you'd imagine, red means there's bigger issues, green, means it's not. And the thing that I, one of the reasons I put this in here is you can see the, the Ravine Park Ravine, that's the ravine that the village stabilized in, you know, 2013-ish. And so this field work all occurred after that. You can see the green reflects, it's actually in pretty good shape. It means it's doing its job. So the grant money that went towards that is working the way we wanted it to. Um, the South Ravine, or what oftentimes in time gets called Moffat Ravine, uh, you can see that's got some red and orange and yellow on there, meaning it's aggressive. Yeah. Can I have a question? We could go back to when the stabilization work was done in 2013. I've got the end of the presentation. I've got specific slides on that project. If you want to just wait, we can go over it then. Well, just uh, my simple question is, how was it stabilized? What yeah, I'll show, like I said, I've got specific slides and pictures in the end of here that will show you exactly what we did in that. So, Sounds good. Yep. So this one, though, the reason I want to point that out is we've since done couple of projects in that south ravine, uh, but the, the field investigation doesn't reflect that. So you can see where it's showing that erosion, which again is part of what you know, suggests so it was a good idea. We did some of the stabilization work we did. Again, just so you're right, I've got slides for both of these projects. So I'll go through specifically in the last part of the presentation here and show you both of these projects in a little more detail. So like I said, it's just pointing out we had those issues. So some of the issues we see facing these ravines are um, not dissimilar from a lot of the issues we see facing you know, many things, whether it's transportation, drainage, you know, the, the issue with the underpass in town, um, urbanization, or you know, the more we build, the more water we're making, climate change and what that's doing to water. In the case of the ravines, and we'll get into it this again in more detail in some other slides, it's not just the surface water that's running off and potentially eroding the slopes, but also the bottom. In that 2019 through 2021 period, where we were having, I mean, genu genuinely historic rainfall, um, we, we saw really high groundwater. And what happens then is you see a lot of upper slope failure just because there's so much water in there, it adds a lot of weight to the slopes and they fail. Um, natural erosion, you know, even in, a, in an un, you know, in, in an unimpacted scenario, Ravines are erosive features, as are rivers, you know, and so you know, a lot of this, it happens over geologic time in a natural setting, but they are erosive by nature. Uh, and so not only is that occurring naturally, we have to deal with it. And then with those things become, you know, come a lot of habitat loss. Um, these are pretty interesting features. <coughs> and I've gathered you all are pretty aware of that, but you know, the lake creates like a microclimate in, in the bottoms of these ravines and stuff. And you see vegetative communities you're more consistent with you know much you know much more northern latitudes just because it stays nice and cool and moist and it, it really is a fairly unique ecosystem to this area as with most natural um you know, natural systems you know in our area invasive species are a big problem we'll get into that a little bit in some of these um, case studies too so uh, again with with the you know, with the urbanization and you know, the climate impacts too, you know, these are just a couple slides I've used in a couple different presentations just to kind of reflect a little bit on what we mean by that. And you know, what we mean is the hydrology changes or how much water we're getting and how fast it's coming. So more water faster is how I've kind of done it. You know, the image or the, the figure on the left up there is what we call a hydrograph. And it's just intended to reflect that, you know, what we see time and time again when you actually like have a gauge in place on something or map out rainfall records is as we've urbanized these areas, added impervious surfaces, taken away natural areas, those kinds of things, 
you know, the peak comes faster and it's bigger. And that's pretty consistent with what we see. Picture there, you know, it's a little bit easier to contextualize than a ravine, but here's a stream we put in a ditch and you can see how corrosive it is. We actually just did a restoration on that one last year and kind of restored that down in um, Carroll Stream. So similarly, you know, um, you know, climate change obviously is what it is with respect to an issue. Uh, in our um, state, um, we're lucky to have um, our Illinois State Water Survey and the University of Illinois have been one of the leaders in the country on hydrology. And um, I, I went to Madison, so I'll concede that to them. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, what they've done over time is maintain a, you know, what, what has been a bulletin essentially of, you know, essentially a, a, a large scale statistical analysis of a wide range of rainfall records. So this is taking actual measured rainfall. And then, you know, that's where we calculate, you know, when you hear about a 100 year storm, they're taking that, running a bunch of statistical modeling over it and figuring out what those storms mean. So, you know, the first time, you know, the, the, well, I guess the last time they did that um, was in the early 90s. We called that Bulletin 70, and that defined, you know, even in our county watershed development ordinance, what we would use to define those storms when we designed. Well, in 2019, they updated that to just include that next 30 years worth of rainfall. So this is just adding actual measured gauge rainfall information. And what we saw is when we then run the statistics again and redefine that, increases of up to 30% in some of those storms. So you can see that line going straight up from 1900. This doesn't even reflect those 2019, 2020, 2021. And, and that's actual just precipitation. Mm -hmm. It's not like how much water is in the system. It's so it's, yeah, it's essentially what it looks at is the annual precipitation. I mean, it, it gets fairly sophisticated as far as the analysis they do to define those things, but it's really, this isn't like projection. It's saying these are the things we've actually seen and it is going up, you know, and that's reflective of this. So now when we design and, you know, when the county or when the village enforces the county ordinance, you know, luckily, you know, most of the counties in Chicago have actually updated their ordinances to, you know, require the use of this. Similarly, when we do design in town or for any of these ravines, you know, we're not just looking at it saying like, it tells us we have to design to that. We're always at least looking at some of these big storms we've had in the last couple of years. We should make sure what we're doing is gonna be okay for that, or at least understand what the implications of trying to get to that may be. Sometimes cost may dictate we can't get there, but yeah. So then would you be doing things looking at this 30% increase over the past 30 years, or would you be saying, okay, so in the next 30 years, it's probably gonna both. go up? I mean, the answer is both, and a lot of times it's assessing what the impacts and risks are, what the cost may be of all of those things, and there's no clean answer. You know, the more factor of safety we can build in, the more resilience we can build in, the better, but, you know, there's only so far you can go in the context of budget. Some systems where you're just trying to restore things and there's not, say, public infrastructure at risk, you know, you may be willing to accept a little more risk in it. It's all, in, in, in the case of these ravines, they're the same, but they're, they're unique enough where you're sort of making those decisions as you go through an individual project. So we look at some pretty typical failure mechanisms of these things, and, you know, I'm sure, you know, wandering around town, you've all seen similar, you know, scenes to some of these pictures. Um, failures of the slopes, you know, that's what we mean. The side, you know, up when, when you come up those those slopes from the, the, <coughs> the bed of the ravine, um, erosion or what we call incision of the bottom. I mean, you think about it, you know, like an incision, like you'd be, you know, doing surgery or something. It's cutting through the landscape. Um, you know, what happens a lot when that toe or when the bed um, erodes and goes down, the toe of that slope or the bottom of the slope becomes unstable, you know, unstable and fails. Um, where you've got uh, inputs of either surface runoff, so water just running across the landscape, or in particular a pipe or some kind of concentrated flow. Um, you'll see gullies forming on the side slopes a lot. Um, at outfalls, you know, again, whether it's a, a, a village culvert or bridge or, you know, a home, you know, some kind of storm sewer outlet, you'll see a lot of scour because that's, you know, very high velocity flow. And then with all of these things, be, you know, the, the ecology of these areas gets degraded. And so some of these really natural ecosystems have been pretty impacted by that. Um, these are just a few pictures from some you know, problematic things we've seen. I like that second one a lot. That's a big red oak that the trunk is actually out over the slope. Last I checked, it's three years strong. Staying there, I have no idea how. <laughs> Physics wouldn't seem to suggest that's possible, but it's there. Um, so hey, you know, think about these pictures a little bit. They'll come back in a couple slides. 
Solutions, uh, what, do we, what do we do to fix this stuff is, is always part of it. So we look at stabilizing the grade, and by that we mean, you know, looking at what the elevations were, what they are now, and what they can be, and, and trying to lock those in place because as that bottom erodes, the stability of those slopes goes away, the stability of the bottom goes away, so we want to stabilize that. Uh, similarly, those gullies, think of those as small ravines coming down the side slope. We do very similar things there. Um, we look at drainage. Water is a big part of this, whether it's in the slope or in the bed of the ravine, on the slopes. How do we improve that? Can we redirect it around? Can we do something to improve drainage within that slope? Can we address the water? You know, those are pieces of it. Um, stabilizing the slopes themselves, whether that's with structural measures, so stone or a wall of some kind, or where we can, you know, using natural approaches. And then again, where we can do that and where, you know, where it dictates um, being possible, what can we do in stabilizing this to either preserve or enhance some of those natural communities? Um, this is one of my favorite ravine pictures ever, which is a really nerdy thing to say. Um, but this is um, at Fort Sheridan Forest Preserve, uh, where several ravines come together there. This was last spring, one of the only big rainstorms we had, I think in about March of this year. And you can see where that northern ravine comes in, so the top of the picture, I guess it's actually the south in real life. 10 years ago, we pretty much stabilized that whole ravine with the forest preserve. And you can see the water coming through there. It actually drains more than the bottom one. There's more flowing through there, but you can see it's relatively clear water. And then the ravine coming from the right side, the, you know, the bottom right of the picture, that's a ravine we're actually working with Lake Forest Openlands to try to get grants on now, but it hasn't been stabilized. But again, very similar contextual, but actually drains less surface area. You can see how turbid the water is. So this just suggests that we can actually do things to fix these things, so, um, which we'll get into a little bit here. <coughs> so this is um, some cross-sectional stuff we've done for some master planning for some ravines for, for Lake Forest. But this, you know, all these things we just talked about with some of the landform stuff in the ravines. You know, this is a pretty typical cross-section of a ravine you might see where you've got homes, or in, in this case, that's intended to represent Lake Forest College there. Um, but you know, a lot of a lot of debris on the slopes. You a lot of different kinds of gully instability. You can see in the bottom, you know, as it comes down, the bottom's eroded out there. And you know, if you look at the little um, cutout on the upper part, you know, in this case, we're representing that there's infrastructure you know, that's that's been exposed in the bottom of there. That's a very common thing. You know, one of the benefits the ravines provided when a lot of these communities were being developed is you can get a pipe real deep without having to dig it. You know, so a lot of times we have sanitary sewers, storm sewers, you know, water service that are in the bottoms of these ravines and over time they've become exposed and are at risk. And again, an unfortunately um, not uncommon occurrence. And so that's just you know, sort of represented there. We've got a lot of invasive trees and, and brush on there. You know, there's trees like Norway maples and stuff like that. I know you're talking trees after this. They really shade out you know, these ravine slopes. They're not native trees. They weren't intended to be there. And they really prevent a lot of better woodland vegetation from growing on the slopes and, and keeping things stable. So if you want to give me another click through. So this is kind of a, uh, you know, a, just a proposed rendering of that where we'll come in and do different treatments and we'll show a little bit of these you know, with some photos and stuff later. But stabilize the side slopes. Um, you know, find some way to, to stabilize that bed grade. Oftentimes, that's as simple as stone. And I know, you know from a sustainability perspective, questions arise there. But when you balance you know, what is a relatively cost-effective, stable treatment versus the literal thousands of tons of sediment that are going straight to Lake Michigan every year, my opinion is it's a pretty good trade-off most of the time and can provide stability. For those of you that peek over the bridges into the Ravine Park Ravine, you know, it looks very stark and white, but eventually grows in with vegetation and colors up and looks somewhat natural, starts to hold sediment within all those you know, cavities between the stones and you know, holds that in place. Um, certainly wherever we can, what we're trying to do is bring back native vegetation and use that as a component of the, of the slope stability. Um, you know, sometimes that takes giving it a head start. A lot of times we'll use down trees or trees we may want to take out within the canopy and anchor those in you know, for additional slope stability. And I'll give you a couple pictures of that here. So you can click to the next one. So these are the, the pictures we started with and just some common things. You've got a slope failure on the left side. You can kind of see on the left there, that was a groundwater seep that was coming out that caused that slope to fail. 
another slope failure where you know with the tree there, um, you know some of the you know the bed instability and stuff like that, and then you know this is a culvert outfall that that actually is a sanitary line running through that that's not just a down tree. Um, so now if you want to give me another click group. So you know, this is these are just some treatment options. You know, here you know, we have some instances where we have to build large scale structures just because that's what it dictates. Um, the second picture is actually on the South Ravine, the Moffat Ravine, where we did take a tree that was down and anchored that into the slope to provide stability and then you know further stabilize the toe. This is just when some of the native vegetation is growing in there. Um, this is the third picture, they're actually the exact same you know, site where we brought in and stabilize the grade. You can see this was after um, a pretty big storm after we built it, how much sediment that's collected upstream of these structures that we made. All that sediment in the top picture is going right out to Lake Michigan. And then this is a um, outfall at a big culvert. It's not the same culvert, but similar. Um, in, this, in this case, in Lake Forest, we've done a couple similar ones in Lake Bluff, which I'll actually have some pictures of here. So stabilize things, you get some native vegetation growing. Bed stabilization. The left picture is the ravine park ravine. So again, it's a lot of rock, but when you look above there, it's allowed us to you know, sort of recapture and restore some of the native slope stuff. Um, similarly, some structures we may use in here to try to provide use natural stone if we can. Um, in this case, that drop over that structure takes energy out of the system and, and takes away some of that scouring stuff. The picture on the right is that same structure. You can see the same sign. Um, we had a 100-year storm, I mean, 125-year storm actually statistically come through there, and it did exactly what it was supposed to. I will just say that uh, the Corps of Engineers designed that one and it failed, and we redesigned it for the Forest Reserve and, and Lake Forest Open Lands, and it held. <coughs> I was proud of it. Uh, all right, next one, Drew. Um, slope stabilization. Similarly, you know, think of these as, as mini ravines. Um, this is one we're working on in Wisconsin right now, where it's a pretty deep cut. In there, that's got a 24 inch storm sewer at the head of it. Um, in this case, you know, a lot of those trees that are tipping and dying are dead ash to begin with. But you can see, you know, what we try to do sometimes, like I mentioned, is create a scenario where we'll take those trees and anchor them in there. And that top picture on the right is at Fort Sheridan Forest Reserve. Those things have been in for a decade and they're still getting strong. You do the same thing with rock in the bottom right picture. The rock, the water filters through that rock again. It slows it down. You know, takes um, you know, take some of the sediment and nutrients out of it, and you know, takes some of the erosive capabilities out of it. But same principle. So, so now we'll do a couple little case studies um, in Lake Lake Forest, uh, Lake Bluff. Sorry, we're working all of it down here. So. Um, this is the Ravine Park Ravine. So again, this was a Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funded project. Uh, I bring that up because you know these kinds of ravine projects are actually projects that there is at least right now a fair bit of um, grant money out there for these kinds of projects. They're getting pretty competitive, but a lot of money has been dedicated to Great Lakes um, restoration through several different programs. So it's a good time to be thinking about that, and we've certainly talked to the folks at the village, and I have our eyes open for some opportunities. Uh, this one was constructed in 2013. Um, we ultimately stabilized over 2,200 feet of ravine. Um, the primary goal here, in addition to water quality, which is really what the grant was focused on, was to protect village infrastructure. Um, Ravine Avenue on the north side and beyond the south side, you've got the access road there too. Um, and then obviously some of the private residents. You know, we did here to stabilize the ravine you know, beds and slopes and then you know, ultimately improve water quality pretty substantially um, to Lake Michigan. And you know, again, within there, there's some, you know, some interesting little habitat features that were protected too. So click on the next one. We actually, as part of the grant, you know, these are probably a little bit hard to read here, but I know the presentation will be available. As part of the grant, we owe them a final report. So I pulled up our um, exhibits on, you know, this kind of goes from pre-project all the way through post-project. You can see the bottom right was a big storm that came through the project area um, not long after we finished and you know, did great. Um, I'll point out too that the South Ravine at that, at that point really hadn't had much stabilization, even that Lake Bluff Open Lands project on the west side of the road hadn't happened yet, but the drainage areas or the amount of water that drained them is very similar. So we actually did um, comparative, um, comparative sampling and, and testing of water quality during that, you know, that uh, October event that's listed in photo 10 and found that you know, the ravine park ravine post stabilization had actually had measurably better water quality than you know, the south ravine prior to any stabilization. It was you know, one of the things we were required to show with the grant, but was you know, really interesting to see. So, 
Hey Dave, I have a question. When you when you say water quality, yep. what do you mean by that? Less sediment than it? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's largely sediment. It's a great question. And so I mean, you can think of that. You know, we we hear a lot of things about PFAS and some of these other stuff now. You know, these really you know truly harmful chemicals. And for the most part, our stormwater runoff doesn't have a lot of that in it, especially in these systems that it's coming through flashy. Certainly, there are things coming from roadways and stuff. And I don't want to dismiss that. You know, that's not possible, but. The land use into most of these ravines, it's not like you had a big industrial plant draining most of these sites. So when we talk about pollutants, um, sediment is really sort of the one we use as the earmark for it because you know, nutrients are another one, but a lot of times those are associated with the sediments. Um, there are soluble nutrients, phosphorus in particular, but a lot of times those things ride along with the sediment. And so it doesn't have to be just um, soil sediment. It can be things like leaf load and other solids within there. Leaves actually, you know, move a lot of nutrients through systems. You can imagine how many tons and tons, I mean, hundreds of tons of leaves fall off of the trees on here. It's a natural system, but you know, that carries a lot of nutrients with it. So sediment by proxy, you know, and nutrients, you know, are a thing. You know, this all flows out through, I mean, obviously this is getting to Lake Michigan, but a couple miles away, it's all making its way to the Gulf of Mexico, and some of the issues we're seeing with nutrients and algae down there are real and problematic. So, uh, this is our access point we used um, in a you know, similar you know, photo thing. I'd, I'd encourage you guys to take a look you know, you know, at the presentation, but a lot of times we look at some of the worst failures to get into these ravines, because we know we're gonna have to fix them anyways. So instead of banging up a part of the slope that's not in bad condition, we may actually, in, in, you know, in the case of this project, we looked at the two worst spots and said we want to fix it anyways. So we build a little road out and then just restore it on our way back. Um, it's all grown in with native vegetation. We put some shrubs in there um, on some of it. And, you know, again, it tends to be a fairly effective way to get into here. That is one of the things that drives you know, the financial viability of these projects is they're not easy places to get into. Um, similarly, South Park Ravine, just to point out, these images I've got on the bottom are straight out of that link to the uh, mapping application that Lake County has for here. So you can click on each of those individual little points and stuff and it'll, it'll show you what's going on in there from the county's assessment of it. But this is, again, because their assessment happened before this project, it's showing as having some pretty aggressive issues. So this project actually was two projects, a um, village project at least. I know there's another one going on as a private project and Lake Bluff Open Lands on the west side of Moffat there did a project um, right before ours too. This one about 1,500 feet of ravine. Again, protecting village infrastructure and you know, some private residents. Um, the culvert under Moffat had under, I mean it was old and it had the invert had um, you know, sort of failed out. I'll get to a picture in here a sec. The head wall was tipping in. Um, it, it needed repairs. So that's where the DOT funding came for that part of the project. And then we did a second project with some stabilization downstream. Same general goals and outcomes. You know, so we can click on that. Um, this next slide is just sort of a concept plan we put together, you know, trying to you know, just kind of get everything organized. So you can see we're stabilizing what's coming under the culvert. Um, they fixed that whole embankment up there as part of the DOT project. The culvert was lined, so now we've got another probably 50 years life cycle out of that same culvert just by putting a liner in it and making sure that it's, it's structurally sound. And then we did a series of stabilization things. Um, the little green on the slope, those are gully stabilizations in these cases associated with a couple of village pipes that came down the slope that we restored and repaired on that. And then you know, when we say grade control, what we mean is basically a big rock dam in the bottom. And the idea is to kind of hold the sediment up and lock that in place so it can't cut down anymore. And that tends to just project stability back up through the system. And we space them based upon the grade of the system and try to get as much redundancy as we can. So a couple pictures again. Here's kind of a couple before project pictures. Pretty major slope failure. You can see almost blocked off the channel and over time it erodes. Something I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to imagine is two feet of water moving through there and how much sediment's getting down to the lake. and then, this is actually not a terribly bad picture of the existing head wall before the project. After this picture, and I couldn't find a great one because it was hard to get in there, that whole thing fell off at one point. Um, and you know, part of why that happened is you can imagine how flashy the water moving through that ravine is comes out of there like a fire hose and there was like an eight foot scour pool that had formed kind of where those trees are. The stability for supporting that head wall disappears and the head wall just collapses in. So give me another click. 
This is you know, sort of a you know, same general section of the ravine. We've used some stone, like I said. You know, I know stone is what it is, but in this case, it allows us to stabilize those areas and then rebuild a little bit and restore some of those slopes or at a minimum keep them there, keep those communities, you know, those, those interesting ecological communities. Um, this is that all we replaced the head wall, stabilized that, built in a structure that allows us to collect a little sediment and really the intent of the, the size and, and really the context of that, you know, that pool you see downstream of the pipe is we want to try to design something that takes as much energy out of that water as we can. So as it passes downstream, it's got less erosion potential. So like everything, you know, the water's got you know, both kinetic and potential energy when it's coming out of there. It's very high in kinetic energy, meaning it's shooting out of there and scouring things. If we can use the stone and the design there to kind of take some of that away, because of the steepness, it's going to build back the potential energy, but you've got a period where we kind of minimize the actual scour that's happening. So that's our, our engineering lesson. So. Uh, what, are you, what, are we, what do you do if you got a ravine? First thing I'd say is don't panic, um, especially on a private, you know, private scale. You know, I'd say the majority of places we go, you, you don't have people at risk of losing homes or even roadways and stuff. Not to say that doesn't happen or that it can't be a risk, but for the most part, um, that isn't that doesn't tend to be the case. Obviously, when we get into some of the bluffs where we've seen, you know, when the water level of Lake Michigan was high, which luckily it's back down a few feet now, that can be a little bit different story. Um, due diligence is key. You know, we get a lot of times we come to properties or get called out. You know, the village recommends us or someone gets a hold of us after someone's bought a house on a ravine. I am shocked at how few real estate agents reach out to people like me to have us take a look at ravines um, before people buy. I think it's happened twice to me in the last 15 years. Um, but you know, it's it's good things to think about. You know, if either you're looking, friends are looking, whatever. Consult experts, um, that's self-serving to a degree, obviously, but you know, these aren't things that you know can necessarily be fixed with pretty landscaping. You know, these are things that when, when they get to the point of needing to be addressed, um, you know, there are a lot of us who spend a lot of our careers learning and growing and trying to understand these things, and, and a lot of times that's what it takes to really find the right solutions. I put in talk to your neighbors specifically because going back to the idea that one of the financial drivers of a ravine project is how expensive it is to get to the bottom. Once you're in there, you can get a lot done. So a lot of times piggybacking projects, there's engineering and permitting and that that goes in that can be combined too. More than likely, if you have a problem on your ravine, your neighbor probably has some kind of similar problem and the folks across the ravine, there can be a tremendous cost savings and a lot of bang for your buck um, on expanding projects. I know when we've done village projects, both of the major ones we've done on Lake Bluff, we engaged some private residents and got them engaged. That's almost always our, our tact is to talk to all of the neighboring properties when we're doing public projects. Obviously there are implications with respect to a municipality being able to just, you know, fund restoration um, as there's a lot of private properties on these ravines and precedent is an issue, but the more you can expand these projects, more often they're gonna be more economical. Um, again, then determine your goals. Do you have a ravine that's in good shape and you just wanna really make sure that that ecological community is in good shape? Um, you, do you wanna you know, take care of some of the runoff and build a rain garden in your yard? Do you have something that needs genuine stabilization? Figure out what you're doing and then you know, get to working on a project um, you know, for that. Yeah, that's an easy thing to say. You know, you know, these aren't cheap projects necessarily. The village is certainly aware of that, and that's why the capital planning um, process is part of what drives these things. But being prepared for these things positions you, whether there's a county grant available, maybe you've got a project next to a village you know, project that may be coming in the future. So planning, like anything, becomes real critical in these things to be out in front of what it's going to take and all that. So. That's what I got for tonight. Thank you very much. Um, open it up if there's any questions. You know, I was just wondering, I probably should have asked this right away, but the purpose of this presentation is to educate the SEC committee? That's yeah. correct. Yeah, at one point I believe Member Cole had asked for a general presentation on ravines, and uh, we noted that, you know, a lot of the <laughs> property owners of the ravines and Lake Bluff are uh, residential. They're not village owned, but this is, yes, informative 
um, to talk about some of the concerns with the ravines since these are a feature in the village. Okay, well, you know, I do have a question because I know that ravines and Lake Love are, some of them are park district property, but um, if you think about the length of a ravine, some of them are privately owned. Some of that land is privately owned. I'd say most of them, honestly. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not the issue. Yeah, I was just going to say, so you may say, we want to restore the ravine, mm -hmm. but whoever owns the land may say, well, you're going to wreck my property. Mm -hmm. So how do you get past that? How do you get people to start to cooperate or re-envision what the <coughs> ravine could look like? Yeah. Physics is easy to figure out. It's sure. people that's the hard part, right? Right, right. You know, and so, I mean, it's a really good question, and, you know, like, like we talked about before, each situation is unique. I mean, the because of some of the um, what I'll say is that the age of the plant, I mean, so these are some of the older parcels of the county, obviously, along the lake, and then with the ravines, it creates some really interesting shapes of the parcels, you know, old estates that have been broken up and things like that, so it is, it's a big challenge, um, you know, and it's all over the map, I and mean, we've done, we've done projects, like the, the original ravine park project, where you highlight that there's park district parcels, the majority of the bed of that ravine was park district. You know, so that was one where you've got public ownership and the ability to pursue a grant and really plan a project and get going, knowing that it's in public control and the village had coordinated with the park district. That's when it's easier. Now, even with that project, we had some access that we needed to co you know, coordinate with some residents there um, that would, you know, that needed doing it. For the most part, it came together. Um, we did push the project down a little bit further on to one or two residents just to, you know, to try to not leave it in a place where it didn't make sense. Um, the lower end of the ravine park were being resident it, residents had invested quite a you know quite a number of years ago. As we tend to get down towards the lake too, they've sort of done their erosion already. The closer you get to the lake, so they tend to be more stable. That was the case there. Um, so you know, it, it it kind of varies all across the map. The one thing I'll say is, you know, even from a regulatory perspective, you know, we still need permitting and all that, and the the, the permits protect that we're not allowed. You know, even the village isn't allowed to do anything that would cause impacts off property. So within a, an engineering report we would put together for any restoration, whether it's for a private resident or the village, we're documenting that you know almost invariably we're making things better in these cases, but certainly that we're not making them worse. So in the context of that, you know that's sort of the threshold that you have to cross to make sure you're not going to cause issues for folks upstream or downstream. But beyond that, it gets kind of complex again. You know, a lot of these things, a lot of the public projects happen within roadway right-of-ways that are very limited. And almost almost every time you've got to work off off of that right-of-way. So then you're you know coordinating and negotiating construction easements and long-term maintenance easements, and a lot of times a negotiation pops up where if I'm gonna give you that easement, I want you to stabilize the mine too. Yeah, everything, everything across the board, and you're just kind of assessing all of that on a project by project basis, but it's absolutely Part of it, you know, even with private ravine projects, we've done a number of those too. And you know, the, the property line may be right down the middle of the ravine. And we've seen cases where I want to stabilize it for my case, but I would need the neighbor's permission, and he's not going to grant it. So you're sort of stuck, you know. And that happens. I mean, it's not common because most of the time, if you have an issue big enough that someone wants to fix it, worst case scenario, someone's going to get. I don't care if you do it, if you pay for it, and then they get the stabilization out of it too. But it does happen where, you know, you're prevented from doing something because of that. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain drainage laws and stuff in place that if it truly was a drainage issue or stability issue, you may have a legal right to make certain repairs, but it gets a little complex. Okay, I have another question for you. You know, a lot of the, well, the ravines have a water source. There's mm -hmm. water drawn, flowing through it. So for the ravines and Lake Bluff, what are the water sources? Yeah, another good question. Um, like we talked about with utilities and stuff, um, you know, historically, I'd say, I'm just trying to think, the, the ravines in Lake Bluff all would have been what we would call those intermittent systems, where they're going to have water when there's rain. Mm -hmm. um, but again, because it was a real easy place to drain storm sewers to without having to dig a pond or carry it all the way to the lake, a lot of storm sewers drain to these ravines. You know, that's every community up and down the coast, everywhere they're at. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, a lot of the water is actually coming through these storm sewer inputs and stuff like that. Um, you know, with the big you know, bypass project from the 
aqueduct. Part of what you're trying to do is take some of that flow out of the ravine park ravine. So sure. we've done a couple of things where we've had the opportunity to, to fix some of that, but you know, a lot of times we're designing and we're having to account for that. Then you have groundwater. You know, right now we're real dry, so there's not a lot, but there is um, you know, in those glacial sediments and stuff that are there, there's different sand seams that bring water to there too. So you have groundwater inputs too. They're not a huge component of that. Most of these ravines around here in summer are pretty dry. There might be a little water and pools in there, and then they just get it when it rains. Mm -hmm. um, when we're in a wet period, the winters can be interesting times to go out there because there's no vegetation, and you can see those groundwater seeps because there'll actually be ice on the slope coming out. You know, sometimes it's a lot. Of, it's easier to see it than not. Certainly. So, so I grew up running around in those ravines, right? When I was a little boy, four years old, and it was kind of the highlight of my childhood being able to have these instant access to these wild natural spaces. Mm -hmm. And granted, there are not maybe used by the youth today <laughs> as they were when we were kids, um, but the, the ravines have always been a very important natural feature for the village of Lake Bluff. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, they were the initial spaces where citizens would come and just sit in the woods and not be surrounded by the filth and noise and chaos of the city. And as we continue to deal with increased stormwater management, um, you know, I distinctly remember, I moved away from Lake Bluff when I was about 18 and came back when I was about 28. And I distinctly remember being shocked at the amount of erosion that had happened in that time for these reasons. And with you know the groundwater being a more pressing and pressing issue, knowing that the groundwater drains into those ravines is one of the reasons that I wanted to have this conversation specifically with this committee because groundwater is not something groundwater runoff is not something that's going to go away. And so, first of all, I want to thank you so much, Dave, for just all the work that you put in educating this committee and letting us know the good work that has been done in protecting these ravines. After other conversations with um, plans for, for instance, the park district and Lake Bluff Open Lands and the projects that they are having, um, it's come to my attention that the management of the ravines is something that is very fractured. It is a mixed bag of responsibility from the village, the park district, private residences, and Lake Bluff Open Lands when they are engaged. And so one of the things that I think this committee can do and should do is be sort of the conduit for making sure that preserving all ravines in Lake Bluff in the area is something that, that we can spearhead and be somewhat of a, um, what's the best way to do A source of inspiration and communication for all parties involved. Um, specifically when it comes to private residences. And I know that Lake Bluff Open Lands and the Park Districts are planning to do a lot of restoration work. And Sue, I don't know if you would like to come up and discuss uh, what those plans are. I don't know if I can even, can I recognize her and ask her to speak? Yeah, we, I was gonna open it up to the audience after the board was closed okay. Um Well then, why don't, I, I just wanna say this. Um, I know that in the past, when restoration work has happened with the ravines, private residents have stood in the way because they don't want their trees to get chopped down, even if they're Norway maples, which are massively invasive right now in the ravines. I think we need to do our best to get ahead of the people who are going to protest any restoration work that might happen by educating, informing, and providing resources to every single person and party that's involved that can help us protect these ravines in the long term. And so uh, I, I would like Sue to come up and, and talk to us about the plans for what Lobola has and, and the Park District has and uh, um, any obstacles that we might help waylay before they happen. Well, because uh, something might impact you, why don't we go around the board and see if anyone's got any other questions or comments. Okay. Uh, I think, um, uh, Dick, is your firm uh, going to be involved in the deep tunnel project, as it's being called, to you know take all the water from the uh, viaduct that runs down North Avenue and increase the pipe underneath? Yeah, not, 
directly. Um, we've been, you know, we've, we've, we looked at some of the Lily and Dell stuff with the restoration, you know, with, um, after the bluff restoration project. So I helped Jeff and Drew a little bit, just, you know, kind yeah. of guide some of that stuff. Um, we actually looked, um, as part of a contract we have with IDOT, you know, we had looked at that issue, I don't know, eight, nine years ago, with an eye on the fact that we had done all the design work for the Ravine Park Ravine, because one of the, one of the options that obviously has continued to be, or had continued to be um, looked at was the viability of using, you know, directing more water to the ravines. Yeah, our, our report certainly concluded that that would take a lot more restoration and stabilization to accommodate. It's already eroding, and so I, I that went in a different direction. So, no, not directly. I mean, we're, we're assisting Tesco with the comprehensive plan update right now in part because of our, you know, understanding of these kinds of things and making sure that they're getting reflected there. So, tangentially, around all of that, but we're not doing any design for that right now. I just want to make the council a, a group aware of, of that project. Um, it's going to be a, a massive project, and uh, there will have implications on stormwater project that we're looking at, which is absolutely necessary for the village. I mean, we've got flooding issues everywhere, uh, or in particular areas, it's very severe. Um, as I understand it, that engineering project, the funding and the, the involvement of the state and federal officials only brings it to a certain point. So we get to that certain point and we're trying to, okay, you want to fix the ravine and it's $20 million. We, we, we as a village have to understand where that money's coming from and how we fund it. Mm -hmm. Because it's two parts. Get the water away, but then you gotta get it down <coughs> properly to the lake, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's definitely at some point as that moves along, I know it's a slow train, um, you've gotta take a look at what that, that last, last mile, last you know, 100 yards of that project is gonna cost to do. So. Um, so open it up to audience and, and You know, I just want to add one more thing. I think it's pretty exciting to think about how the, mem the SEC committee can play a role in ravine restoration and habitat protection for the future, mm -hmm. you know, for hundreds of years to come. So I think that's very exciting. I think that the idea of education is critical, but it's often not enough. Mm -hmm. You know, so we can, a, a lot of people who live on ravines are already, already very well educated about what ravines are. Yeah. But how do we protect the ravines from private landowners who say, this is my land, and this is what I'm doing on my land? You know, that, that's beyond education. And I don't know 
where that can go <coughs> is it's an important factor in how can we be stewards of the land, whether it's privately owned or not. Certainly, and one thing I, I would just throw into that specific to Lake Bluff, but also you know, sort of broad based a little bit is, yeah, I, and what you can't usually do is compel people on a private property to restore or enhance. Right. But you, know, you do have um, you know, parts of your village code that do have requirements for what can and can't happen in a ravine, and those are aimed at not at, at identifying some of those failure points and situations that you know, we've looked at that happen and, and trying to prevent things from happening that are going to make things worse or cause those kind of failures. So there is some protection in place, and you know, certainly, you know, the, you know, Lake Bluff and most of the other communities that have these resources have re reflected that in their in their local codes as part of that. So there is some level of protection, but like you said, it's that next step of getting over the hump of of you know restoring, preserving, you know, enhancing kind of thing, as opposed to just making sure we're not making it worse. Um, these big storms we're getting are real. You know, I mean, that's you know that that's a it's a thing that we're going to have to be resilient to when we think of because you know what we see <coughs> here is the case a little bit with. Birch Avenue we're being too that the village has a piece at the bottom is we get big storms like the one we had you know 2017 was obviously a real big one for folks but um, even even last summer you know that we had in this very localized area we had another hundred plus year event and you know everyone's oh the news that we had another hundred year event well yeah it's a statistical thing and you know there could be a hundred year two hour event and a hundred year twenty four hour event and it, it's all different but realistically that crossed that threshold. A lot of times what happens in those is, is the systems get mobilized, meaning the erosion starts. Maybe there was a tree there that had been holding that ravine in place for a decade, and that storm flushes that tree out, and then that erosion starts really aggressively. So there's a lot of cases where you look at something and you go back a year later, and it's totally different in you know, which these systems are to begin with, but you know, all of a sudden you're, you're playing catch up. So that gets to your point of proactivity can be, um, you know, can be very necessary to make sure that things don't get away from so I think you bring up a really good point of, you know, Lake Bluff has some some good uh, things in our code that can help us mm -hmm. sort of ensure that we're protecting those ravines. And I wonder if we, uh, I mean, I would, I think we would be open to recommendations on updates to our code yeah. that I could agree. help us <coughs> potentially have a greater influence over private landowners when it comes to restoration and protection of these ravine habitats. I, yeah, I, I think, think some of those things are part of the comprehensive plan update is to look at you know, some of those codes and stuff and see as it relates to some of the recommendations, you know, are there enhancements mm -hmm. that you know, can be added. So I think that is in process by the village. Mm -hmm. I think, I think part, of the, part of the process too is you have to have a carrot. You can't just have sticks. Right. Okay, and the carrots could be if there is a group that will be working with, um, say, the, the park district, the SEC, the village board, and, and, and inviting residents, is what can we do to provide funding to align grants from state and federal agencies to help private homeowners make improvements, to make it an incentive and not a penalty mm -hmm. to do things. So um, I think there are, there are some options there that we could consider in terms of um, the SEC being cooperative with the Park District, we, when we were on the Village Board, we still have the Tri Board mm -hmm. Committee, which was a separate group which uh, met with the school and the Park Districts on joint issues. Mm -hmm. So that could be a, a subcommittee on uh, just for means with getting these various groups together, inviting members of the public and kind of working on ideas. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, um, you want to come up? Sure. Give us your name and address and Thank you. Yes, I'm Sue Raymore. Um, I'm going to put the mic in my seat. Are you going to stick around? Sure. Yeah. Then I might have to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Sue Raymore. I've been in Lake Bluff um, 35 years. I am um, Vice President of the Lake Bluff Open Lands, and I am also the Lake Bluff Park District. I'm a commissioner on the Park District. So I have a unique fit here. Um, I am passionate about the r Ravine Park. We also, um, our land trust, land trust Alliance, or for the easements, some easements in Lake Bluff and some of the ravines, and we actually own, we own the ravine right at Moffitt. Yeah. So we have the house there right on the corner of Moffitt and Witchwood. So we have a, a unique relationship, Open Lands does, with ravines. Um, when I first 
came into open lands, I started um, looking at the ravine to the dismay. McKamey and I were neighbors for many years and um, took it on and, and got, Cliff Miller had done a plan and it was, wasn't for the waterway, it was for the flora. So I was looking at erosion prevention and back in 1995 he said, get rid of the Norway maples and burn the ravines so, and get rid of your invasives. So the invasives were pretty much removed. There's, they're always coming back, but um, for the most part, but the Norway maples had not been removed. He said, because he, he specifically said in, in 20 years you'll have a problem. And so now here it is, almost 30 years later, we have a problem. And um, we had a lot of resistance with neighbors who you know, didn't want trees down. So we've been working on that. Um, I would say right now, I think our biggest problem with the ravine is that we have so many Norway maples, there is no vegetation underneath there. So if you want to hold the, the soil, you're not gonna hold, as you said, there's only so much you can do with plants, but plants can be very effective in helping to hold the soil, um, but you've gotta get some sunlight to it. So we had started taking trees down and met with some resistance. And we had community meetings, and so we're kind of in a holding pattern right now. We have not been able to take any Norways down. We have re-engaged Cliff Miller, who's come in to do an update of our plan, and every, you know Cliff, mm -hmm. everyone knows Cliff, I think. So he, we're in the process of getting an update on the plan. It really hasn't changed. It's get rid of the Norway maples. Um, how we do it is gonna be what Cliff really helps us with. It speaks right to what you're saying, McKinney. It's gotta be to get the community involved. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the other problems we have is sort of abuse of the users of the ravine. Um, you know, one neighbor says, get the kids out of the bicycles. I said, well, the adult that takes his big, huge bike in there every single day and kind of flaunts it um, is probably more problematic than a 60-pound child riding in the ravine. We have neighbors that consistently blow leaves in, and we do have ordinances for some of this, but they aren't enforced. I, I don't... I don't know whether it's because it's the park district and the village and who owns what. And, um, it's a complex ownership because the park district owns both sides of the ravine from Evanston to Glen. From Glen to Gurney, it's on the north side that neighbors own the land. So um, it's, it's interesting. And then once you get to Moffitt, the park district owns wherever there isn't a house. Um, so it's, it's complex, um, but we, the other thing that I have, which I'm curious about, in looking at other ordinances in other communities, first of all, the good thing for our ravine is based on the, I think it was the Great Lakes Alliance had done a review of all the ravines in the area. The ravine park ravine has one of the lowest slopes, mm -hmm. or the least, which would, so less likely to have severe erosion. Um, but it also has a lot of water dumping into it from all over the village, and that's gonna go away. However, there's at least 26 homes that have pipes that go right into the sides of the slopes. I know in Highland Park, for example, the ordinance there says the pipes has to go in at the water site, not up high, so you've got that option for erosion too, and you can go in and see them there, cracked and broken all over. So our plan is to work with Cliff to get our final plan we're also working on a tree inventory because our idea is we're going to have, try to get grants because there's a lot of trees, a lot of trees, a lot of Norway maples. Um, and um, once we have the management plan and the um, tree inventory, then we can really start looking for grants. Um, so that's, that's where we are. That's we hope to. And Sue, so as we, is that Mola or the Park District? Which we are. That is, yeah, right. <laughs> or is it both? <laughs> well, it's the Labola Health facilitating with the Park District. Um, it is obviously a relationship with the Park District because they're the ones that have engaged Cliff Miller. Okay. And um, with Labola, hopefully, doing most of the work. We can't, obviously. We were in there a couple years ago taking out trees. We're very careful about what we take down because we aren't going to be in a situation where we have any risk to homes or private property. Mm -hmm. So there's a limit to how much we can do. Um, so Sue, so knowing that the park district is managing right now, the park district sort of side of the ravines, 
how can the village help extend the preservation efforts that you're doing in the park district side into maybe the more private property sides of things? <coughs> what can this committee and by extension the board do to help you continue to do good work for the I like what you talked about, about having a group that it's really gonna have to be education for the homeowners. Mm -hmm. um, some of, we have some homeowners that have done phenomenal work in their meetings. Mm -hmm. um, they've had Chicago Botanic Garden, they've been looking for plants of concern. It's, it's just been wonderful what they've done. So, um, I would love to celebrate those people in any way that yeah. we can. Uh, the, the work that they've done and the, those individuals who are good stewards of the ravine um, on any channels that we can if possible. Yeah, I would love to. Um, continue with the restoration work and get the neighbors. So what Cliff has said we want to do is section by section of the ravine and the strategy would be to take the areas where there is good flora and get rid of those trees to keep it, keep, keep it there. So pres preserve what you have first um, and work with the neighbors individually. Like whenever you're going to be working in a section to, to have meetings with the neighbors so that the neighbor, neighbors get brought in but understanding that the only way this is going to get resolved is really the Norway Naples. I mean, it's dense. I don't know if you've been to the mm -hmm. park. Dense. So. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. It's very pretty detailed. Yeah. <coughs> All right. So we move to the next. Um, can I make a final recommendation? Sure. Yeah, I, we, no, yeah. um, you go first and then okay. I may take. I mean, I, I, I would like this committee to make a recommendation to the larger board that we assist both the Park District and Favola in all restoration efforts and by extension reach out to the citizens who will be directly affected by this work, whose property lines are touching the, each phase um, with direct communications informing them exactly what's going to happen and why it's going to happen uh, so that we can sort of mm, get ahead of any resistance that they might face. And I'd like to hear your thoughts from, from the group on that. I, I think it's, I would support, recommend to the board, they establish a subcommittee and have our district member, have a local member, have a SEC committee or two member, and those meetings take place in the report back you know with plans and strategies i think that as you know we mentioned regulations are part of it your efforts in getting grants um, available could be made as more of a group effort mm -hmm. and provided as a resource to property owners like hey would you like a survey there's money available mm -hmm. in our pool for next year for you to use one of our recommended people as far as the tree taking down the cost or replacement of trees could come out of certain you know, resources. So I think it. I think it would be fine to. I would be in support of recommending to the board they establish a, a subcommittee. Does that sound like a plan? Mm -hmm. I think that's a good first step. Okay. I do too. I think it's a great first step, and for us to get involved, become part of the team, everyone with the same goal mm -hmm. of restoring these valuable ravines, no matter who owns what. We just get this one mindset, mm -hmm. and then our role can be to get it to the village trustee mm -hmm. level, right? And then maybe look at the codes, and you know, Sue's point about the codes might be there, but how are they enforced? Mm -hmm. And your point about it can't just be a stick; we have to have a carrot too. So I think it's very exciting because um, Lake Bluff and the whole North Shore here is known for ravines, they're unique, they're valuable, and they're being degraded by the way that everything's organized right now. Mm -hmm. So I would love to make that recommendation. That seem good to the committee? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so send a note send a, to the board recommending this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next up is the tree, speaking of trees. Uh, tree update, tree species rating guide. Got some good comparisons between communities, the Morton guide, Lake Bluff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with this one, uh, basically at our previous meeting at uh, 
quite a while ago, we had some SEC members express an interest in reviewing the village's tree species list, um, and that's found in the zoning regulations of our code. And uh, we had a presentation back in June from Colette Kopik with the Morton Arboretum CRTI group, and uh, basically it discussed best practices to maintain a resilient urban forest and uh, really kind of highlighted the importance of species diversity and putting the right tree in the right place, uh, things like that. And so uh, the goal of this discussion is to get some recommendations or just some feedback for the PCZDA to consider. They're the ones who ultimately would be recommending any text amendments that are required as part of this grant that we have through the Morton Arboretum to the village board. So um, the goal of this is to get any additions or revisions, so such as uh, kind of adding any trees that we don't have on the list to the Morton Arboretum or from the Highland Park list or from both, kind of something like that, and discuss any other tree-related goals. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I recall the conversation we had on this. There was some sort of uh, discrepancy on our recommendations between natives and non-natives, um, specifically due to climate change and the resilience of uh, potentially non-natives have over native trees. Um, after doing some more research and, and consulting with some, some individuals who are more knowledgeable on this subject than I am, uh, I would like to recommend that uh, whatever list that we put forth has at least uh, a 70% native list, uh, knowing that native trees are where our birds and bugs and caterpillars, where those habitats are established um, because they are the food sources of the larger animals and foster basically the foundation of these ecosystems. And they are, will not be nesting within those native, excuse me, within those non-native trees. Um, so I may not be knowledgeable into the individual tree species that are on this list, um, but I have heard from multiple individuals that a baseline of 70% native, if not better, um, is probably a wise recommendation for us. Just yeah. something to consider with this list is this is the list that will uh, go towards parkway trees first and foremost and second uh, it'll be for replacements for uh, when somebody takes down a tree but that parkway tree uh, if you remember in the presentation it was something where she kind of talked about that right tree in the right place and kind of prioritizing uh, maybe the more native species or specifically native species and the areas that aren't within the right of way. So that is something to consider with that. And sometimes the trees that are in the parkway might need to be more resilient and might need to be some of that. And that might be something to consider as well. Yeah, so off that, um, do we have a list like, I know you're saying for replacement trees, do we have a list like this that's easily accessible to the citizens of Lake Bluff for if they want to look into getting native trees or they need to get new trees or something like that? It's on, yeah, it's within our zoning regulations and our municipal code, so it is available to residents. But I, but I think back to education and publicity, which we've talked about it before, I remember seeing the Lake Forest, they had some nice, really, 11 by 17 diagram pictures, sketches of trees, and it was kind of like the trees of Lake Forest, and it was, it was something that was really promoted out to the residents, and so they start thinking in their mind, you know, what are the preferred trees? Like we have a playbook right in town for, mm -hmm. but I think I think there's a way to take this and maybe really just educate the residents a little bit more. They shouldn't have to dig for it. It should be something that they're just yeah. kind of. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing I would add about, and again, I'm not an expert either, but I know that with when we talked about species, animals, birds, what we're seeing is is that birds that were never seen in Lake in Lake County or in this region are showing up because of climate change. They're, they're migrating, they're moving into new territories. So I think a, a mix, even if it's 30% or 20%, I'm not an expert on it, but what I'm saying is, is that there could be, as climate changes, what is native, and that includes both uh, animals and birds, 
could change over the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, the definition of native so does not you're, change, you're, right? You're, you're, if there's <coughs> different things, because there's native that could be anywhere in the U.S., it's right. just sort of what zone, what place, right. as opposed to like a ginkgo, which right. doesn't belong. Right, right, and I don't know if that's so, a fine differential. Like, if there's a tree, I'm just going to use Atlanta, okay? Right. And, and I've seen projections of saying that the climate in Illinois, you know, 30, 40 years from now could be Atlanta. Right. You know, I'm just thinking, could what, be, yeah. what species, well, could is a very big could. But we know that we've seen birds in here that aren't, that are moving. Yes. So, so I guess non-native versus, you know, 30 miles to the south or 50 miles or 100 miles. I guess that's the question I have about all of it. But I think that's taken into account in Is things it? like the more yeah. okay. arboretums list. Okay. Um, I think it's really more exotic and whatever. So when they say non native, it's not even like regionally anywhere. Is that what they're saying when they say it's not? Usually non native. Or, like, well, they said native to Illinois. Right. Right. Okay. There but, yeah. So there, there are two, there are two yeah. different. Like a ginkgo isn't native. No. Anywhere. No, it's, it's Australia. Australia. Right. Yeah. So those are two different things. And I think what Claire was trying to get at is in parkways you have salt, you have right. you have other issues <coughs> like that. And, um, so I think we recommend as much as we can. If you use right. natives, there may be some where you don't. Again, there's you know, planting in clumps tends to the trees tend to do better. Um, right. when they have nearby neighbors. <laughs> like there's new we're learning more. Right. And are there some trees within that are native or native to Illinois that would be more climate resilient to hotter, drier, or flash floods? Out of this list, and you've got a lot of trees on here, are there trees that really have like an A-plus rating? So I think more it would be about um, habitat types. So okay. if there's ones that are better for wetter areas, uh -huh. so and that came up in here. Um, as well, <coughs> white oaks and the, you know, whatever. So I think having it maybe framed that way. I love your idea of the brochure. I have one, I think, from Lake Forest for years yeah. in a file, because then it shows you the profile right, and sort yeah. of the height and compares yeah. them all, and then the foliage and all that. But if you if you have on your sheet 15 of the ones you recommend the most, that's mm -hmm. what people are going to mm -hmm. go to. Well, what I'm wondering is if this chart would be expanded to have like a column that says ideal uses. You know, wet location, this yeah, location, mm -hmm. streetscape. And that type. actually was included in a, okay. uh, not in this oh, packet okay. though, it was in the previous one with the Morton Arboretum. Um, if you want to take a look at that, uh, we so can that send that a, out so again. So that could be adapted into the Lake Bluff and that's it, it could be adapted in or if there's trees from the list or you know if we say you know morton our <coughs> is the experts we will adopt the trees that we have along with that list something along those lines okay. um, well, you know and here's a question again about this um spreadsheet we have so species group a remind us what that means yeah so species group a is the most highly rated group and when public works is replacing you know parkway trees that's the group that they will try to get and it's kind of up to nursery availability and things like that as mm -hmm. well but that's uh, going to be the ones that they'll replace the trees with as you get in the lower species categories it gets more into the uh, replacement factor. So species A trees that are removed will have um, <coughs> higher requirements than the lower species list. So getting into what um, we were talking about with regards to what could be included in this table, I would love to see this information sorted a little bit differently. Okay. I like that it's sorted by groups. I think that's great. And I like seeing the Highland Park list and the Morton Arboretum list. But what I would love to see is it then sorted again by natives first. So we can see Group A, Highland Park, yes, Morton Arboretum, yes, native to Illinois. So in other words, do you understand what I'm saying about changing the sort? Just putting the natives at the top and yeah. the non-natives. Within each category? Yes within each category. So in, in other words, you could do it alphabetically, you know, just yeah. <coughs> sort that column. 
so that the ends come before the eyes. Yeah. yeah, the further I scroll down this list that we have in front of us, the more I'm seeing non-native trees to Illinois. In, in yeah, that's in why I would love to see Egypt. the natives prior, you know, you get what I'm saying. Group right. A, Highland Park, yes, Martin Arbor, yes, and then all, all the natives. Yeah. And the, the reason oh, here that I think might be relevant with this list, it's not up there anymore, so I don't, I, but I don't think I saw anything about a budget. Citizens or other people might want to yes. know which ones would be native and budget friendly right. versus more expensive. Right. Yeah. I guess the question I have on this isn't for tonight, but you know, let's take a non-native, but there's two here uh, in the group area uh -huh. that are non-native, but both Highland Park, which is normally very yes. smart, yes. and the Morton Army, and we've given them a yes <coughs> in the species group A, the highly rated. Why was that? I have no idea. Are, you know, ginkgo, I know that ginkgo is the signature tree. It's the trademark of Morton Arbor. Their symbol is a ginkgo tree. Really? Yes. Uh, that's, we, that's it is. Funny. But the history of Morton Arbor is very interesting. And, yeah. You know, I would not say anything against them. But, but they, I think they're, I mean, they're often used in cities. They're very tolerant um, trees. Mm -hmm. Yes, and they, you know, when I was growing up, they were very prized as exotic and long-lived and beautiful. But as far as value to the environment, ecological value, is, ecological really value low. is low. So to your point, I don't know why that would be a yes. Because if we say but what's the most important to us, it will survive well. Yes, that and so maybe. then we say what's more important, that it's native or that it's going to live a long time and do that. Yeah, I think it might be well, probably on not. there because of well, the climate it provides shade and well, lowers heat well, temperatures. Different yes. trees have different functions, especially when it comes to application. Uh, public, yes, a, a, a public usage, right? Yeah. Uh, we're not discussing private usage right now, we're just discussing public. So, ornamental flowers, you know, Mayor, one of my favorite quotes of Mayor Daly is the more flowers that you plant in the city, the slower people will go because they slow down to look at the flowers, right? When they're driving in their cars. And I think that's a wonderful correlation of just the power that trees have over people, right? Trees and flowers and all that stuff. We know that they, you know, they make us cool in the winter and protect, or sorry, make us cool in the summer, anyway. Yeah, well they take, they, they have three things as far as I can see. You've got the support of the ecological species, which we've talked about here. They reduce heat on them, they provide shade, and they reduce carbon. Yeah, Even and just beautification. Right. Yeah. I, mean, I drive yeah. great pleasure looking at yeah. that beautiful ginkgo right. on McKinley. But they're like, also windbreaks, they're live fences, they're right. there's fireworks, there's, there's, they're, they're yeah. functional so I, uses. So I think that even if we sort, there's, there's there's the application, why why this tree, and then where's what's the ideal uses, what are the benefits of this? Which is what I think these species groups are. Species group A is for canopies, right? Species group B is, uh, I guess, more canopies? No. It's, yeah, it's not quite. Yeah, it's canopy, okay. understory, understory. But even so maybe there's something, you know, we talked about habitat type, the benefits of non native <coughs> Well, this one's on the list because. Right. Because if I was going to pick a tree from my backyard and a canopy, and I, I'm looking at all of this, I'm like, okay, you got a yes and a yes, this one's a no. Why would I want this tree over that tree? I know it's not native, but maybe it's better. You know, if there's yes. a column that just, there's a decision process, on yes. it, like you said, why, why is this on here? Then no matter what you sort it, there's a decision like, okay, this really isn't good for species, but I, I need this for this application on street with salt. Yes. Know. And you know, another great value of the trees is the canopy slows down the rainfall. That's huge, especially on bluffs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, the value of trees is not that they can hold the bluff up, but that they break the rainfall. Mm -hmm. I mean, That's I, the true value. Yeah, I, I love that this list has what Highland Park has, what Morton has, and then whether or not it's native to Illinois. And I would almost like to make a blanket statement of like, <coughs> if there are two no's in those three categories, then it should be considered removed from our list. Whether it is no for Morton, or no for Highland Park, or no non-native. If it has three no's, it, it should be removed completely. If it has two no's, it should at least be considered to be removed unless further investigation warrants its, its state. Just to give us some sort of qualification for judging what species go on to this list, because none of us are arborists, and I don't think there are, I don't think the village has a forester on staff, do we? Mm -hmm. No, we don't have an uh, arborist on staff. We don't have an arborist, but we do have a forester? But well, it's 
it's kind of like a designee, and he would be the person who would make the decisions on the trees at but this point. Jay guess. I think he's a certification. But he is not a sort of. Uh, he, he's not an arbor, a certified arborist. He might be a certified arborist, but he doesn't he's, have a degree in. Sorry, he's not a certified no, arborist. Oh, he's not. No. So there's no forester or arborist employed by the village anywhere? No. There's there, yeah, there's no certified arborist. Our code kind of says the village forester, he acts in the, in the role of the decisions that are made based on that. Just well, that might be something we take out of it as well to help us. But, yeah. but you know, getting back to sorting, I don't mean to get too techy about this, but your idea is if it's two no's, if it's two no's, <coughs> it should be a no from Lake Bluff. You can change the sorts to give us the information the way we can look at it. So it is help make decisions. It is important to have a wide diversity, though. Just experience has taught us that mm -hmm. if we have too short a list, we get in trouble. Yeah. yeah. Have you heard of microphones? Have you guys heard of yes. microphones? Yes. 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 They're so cool. They are cool. something in private. It would be a neat demonstration. Yeah. We could get involved. Do that to be a neat demonstration. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think this is, you know, particularly for the residents, this this definitely needs more information for them. Yeah, I think more. so. I, I think it needs, we need more information. But, but I really appreciate it. I mean, he's already narrowed down to this. We don't want to narrow it down, yeah. like I said, to eight trees, because I'm going to have a bunch of troubles. But yeah, okay. And, and even if we get more information about uh, the definition of what these groups, you know, if I were looking at this, I would say, well, what is species group A? What does that mean yeah. exactly? You say, well, that's the value. Well, what does that mean? Because then you're going to equate, you're going to look at that and say, native price. Maybe use. part of it depends. Is this list really internal for the village and it's available to the public? It's really sort of the village's priority list? Because we're talking all about public facing and maybe that's not the right audience. This is the village list, right? So yeah. this is this is the list that the village uses when they plant trees and also when uh, replacements are required. You were remote in the remote shot. I was wondering who Jay was talking to. Sorry. Hey everybody. Where where is he? Yeah. Who's that in a Can I can I make a couple comments? You know, clarify a few things. So, wouldn't that be nice for us? <laughs> um, so, um, going back, so the list that you're looking at, the original list in the zoning code was established by the zoning board, ultimately by the village board, but that was recommended. And that original list was developed using a consultant, um, probably this, the, the Midwest preeminent consultant on trees, who's actually not an arborist, but he's, but he's a forester and has decades of experience uh, Chuck Stewart from Urban Forest Management. Mm -hmm. um, so that list was built off a set of goals which the village wanted to, to determine what were the trees they wished to protect the greatest under this new regulation. Um, the village had a tree in it, um, a minimum of, uh, I think it protected trees around eight inches. I'm going, I can't remember, it was several years ago. But, um, anyway, they wanted more protection trees and they wanted decide which trees they want to protect <coughs> at this level. Mm -hmm. And so they, they built that list around natives and other, um, I think the ginkgo tree was on there because it was a very common and resilient tree used in parkway applications. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think, I don't know where this is headed, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think the, the overall comments that you have provided in direction is crystal clear as far as I can tell from what I heard. And that is, it is where possible, let's lean towards natives when that makes the most sense. And I think that's adequate for them to carry this over to the zoning board to start their process with it um, for a couple of reasons. One of which is, from the village's perspective, and I think the comments have been made about um, by certain individuals here is, in terms of the list, the bigger the better, right? For the greater amount of, and that's what the more Arboretum told us, that's what we're hearing from other foresters is the more choices, the better for the list. And then we can group them as we see. You can't make a recommendation to the zoning board on that. They'll probably look at that list and make their own list too, and then all that will go to the board. 
Can I ask why the zoning board is dictating what goes on this list? It's in the zoning code. It's in the zoning code. <coughs> the regulations relate to the tree protection in the villages in the zoning code, which is common. Okay. All right. So I guess the second part of this is, is this being used internally in the village for planting trees where we plant trees for when trees are removed on private property and have to comply with village regulations, right? And then the third part of this we were talking about is that this being adapted to more of the residential educational component, which requires, I think, this to have more information in. So maybe that's a third recommendation if you're understanding what we're saying to the PPCA is how can this list be a, be put together <coughs> like a, I might have a maple that's dying in my front yard. So mm -hmm. I don't know what tree would be appropriate to replace that with. But I could look at this list, but then I'd, I'd be doing a lot of Googling mm -hmm. because I don't know what the decision factors are for me to look Yes. And something to consider with that, let me see if I would be quickly able to pull it up. The report that was given to us by uh, the Morton Arboretum, if you look at the majority of the trees, especially the ones that are in Group A, they're all on that Morton Arboretum list. Okay. And the Morton Arboretum list um, actually goes through exactly what you guys are talking about. Um, let me just see if I can pull that quickly. Um, so there is a spreadsheet that goes into all of the trees that they're recommending. It has whether or not they would be recommended for parkways, medians, um, residential and parks and it also has footnotes as to why they're making those recommendations also kind of whether or not lights required mm -hmm. size information form information so this might be a resource that we, we could use, could to, use. To, yeah. and we could almost take this and, and for residential because you said they had a residential column recommended for residential yeah there's a residential and park section um, that might be narrowed down. Yeah, because, you know, we all have access to that, and that just makes my eyes lose. Right, but, but <laughs> if, we, if we just filter, like you're talking about sorting on native, yeah. this could be sorted first based on the trees we've selected out of this list, and then second sorted on the yes. residential application. Yes. So that there's a, a, a kind of a more narrow resource available for people. Well, what I love about this list is it's very utilitarian. When we're on the site and we have specific requirements such as we have full sun or we have no sun. We have uh, uh, clay soils or we have sandy soils or loamy, loamy soils. You know, we have all of this information in here is going to help someone like, for instance, Jake. You know, and he's like, oh, we got to put something up in here. He can look at the site and say, okay, lots of sun, crappy soil, which tree do I need? That one. And it'll inform him in a very fast way where no Googling is really required. Right. And the other thing, you know, gardeners do that all the time. They select plants based on sunlight, mm -hmm. moisture in the soil, you know, sure. habitat value and fall mm -hmm. color and all kinds of stuff. So I think that, you know, we could enhance this to make it a really great tool. You know, another idea is to um, <coughs> make each of the trees, uh, you know, you tap on it and it takes you to a full page, you tap on it like a link, and it takes you right to a lot of information about that tree. Mm -hmm. You know, so you make it a working list, change the sorts a little bit, and um, you know, of what I would look at, everybody's different, I would look at group A native. I would look at that right away, and then look at, you know, the um, ideal living conditions, and the value to uh, not only the environment, but to you know, uh, carbon sequestering or full color or berries for birds, uh, you know, so I think it's a great starting point, but it can be tweaked. Right, but I think, I think with tool. that information that some of that is here, <coughs> so yes. it needs to be put together, exactly. at least for the residents. Yes, yes. Okay. So I think that's another one. I mean, the high level directive that can pass on the recommendation is beyond favoring natives when it, you know, to protect 
protect those to the greatest level, but also encourage that planting of those. But this is to develop tools to aid residents in tree selection. And that can be directed, that can come yeah. from that list, and if you guys can see that after with to help yeah. develop that, that's another simple directive that I think you can keep this process moving. Yes. And I think the critical thing that all this will lead to is that urban forest plan that we talked about, that's like the second wave of this conversation. That's, I think that's what most of the stuff I'm hearing is comments about what tree where, you know, right tree, right place. I think that's the critical piece that you guys are talking about and can actually give them a lot of directions on that too when that gets developed. Mm -hmm. um, which is they'll just hire a consultant or a barbarist to help produce that document. Mm -hmm. so. okay. I've just got one, one question and that is um, I know a lot of decisions for particularly for individuals get directed by who they contract with and availability. And so personal experience, you have to push really hard to get um, past what's in stock. And so, you know, it's it's important maybe to add to this list as sources of, uh, of natives that are available in, in some uh, uh, landscape companies and nurseries that, that specifically do that. And, and there's not a lot, but you've got to seek them out. Sometimes the residents will be coerced or convinced by the landscape company to say, well, this is better because I got it. It's on my truck. It's on my truck. I'm just planting these trees at your neighbor and I have some extra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And I can black out your job. Like <laughs> um, Drew, I have a question, and so maybe this is um, zoning board, but I have had some residents. Um, talk to me quite passionately about um, a massive, healthy oak that, um, you know, branches went into various neighbors' yards. This is in East Lake Bluff. And the new owner of the property requested to, to have the tree come down, um, which was approved. I guess the code or whatever set or ordinance says then if you replace it with a certain number of new trees. Well, I would love to have that revisited because the science is just growing and growing that big older trees have massively more ecosystem services than four or five new babies. Um, I mean, people were really sort of horrified and upset by that and I just thought science has changed. <coughs> apples to apples anymore so something maybe, maybe to look at especially when you talk about the um, sort of ductile in these studies that oaks provide the most services to um, both, both for insects and birds and stuff right you know you're, you're getting into keystone species so a tree is not just a tree right it's not just well, a thing. It's, it's, but it's also it's when it's big and old and healthy it's doing so much more than four or five little baby oaks that will, you know, in 150 years be that size. So I just thought it might be an opportunity no. to take a peek at that because I think that doesn't really make sense. I think I think it's going to be more than a peek. <laughs> that's come up and like right now I think in, correct people were really there, upset. But I think like right now if you're removing a group A tree, that it's not like a, an inch for an inch. It's actually it's 125 percent. So to your point, like, well, if a tree is 30 inches or greater and it's a native, then maybe it should be 300 percent. Mm -hmm. You know, something that really disincentivizes removal, because then, if it's healthy, you're paying the full freight, and it's it's very expensive, and it becomes almost punitive to take it down, and, and that may you know, that may cause a different conversation in the community. Mm -hmm. I suspect it would, I it but but, there, but the idea if you're taking down a big, huge, yeah. healthy oak for. And I think some certain communities have those and call them heritage trees, right? They get special protection. And our code doesn't have that. Um, trees, you know, a 10 inch like it would a 50 inch. Mm -hmm. and so that I would idea. definitely like to make a recommendation that we establish heritage trees I right do. now. I do too. <laughs> and they can be not look by location, but by size and type. Well, yeah, I think, I think with the whole tree ordinance, it would be let's revisit it, revisit it under the PDZA. Visit under SEC recommendations because that's a whole meeting. Well, 
That's yeah. what's going to happen. Yeah. So I think I think you should roll that into this conversation right now and just have that on the list of that ability to create heritage trees, protect them. <coughs> I'd like, I'd like to review so the ordinance and have a whole meeting on it. <laughs> well, it's, it, it's when it, it gets drafted, right? So the idea that, that that can be part of the request that the SEC can see it again. You know, once it yes. Yeah. But if that's a priority, yeah. then we, I think it yeah. might be a nice idea to just grab onto that. That's an idea that a lot of people get. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, maybe before reviewing everything, and that's another way to approach it. But if you've got one thing that people get excited about, that would be awesome to take that all the way through and get that started, like we did with the leaf blowers. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it was one small thing that we did, and I can't wait for us to talk about that again, but, um, <laughs> you know, because I think it, it made a big difference. I mean, there's a lot to talk about, but I won't go that way, but um, I think that's great. And um, I wanted to get at the word protection because we can um, put measures in place to make it prohibitive for some people not to cut down trees. But for others, it doesn't matter. They can afford to cut down any tree they want and pay as much money as they can and the tree is still and there might be five or six babies there, but this giant, beautiful tree is gone because someone could afford to pay the fee. So that's where I'm getting to my um, definition of what does protected mean. And maybe that's where the heritage tree comes in, which is you bought some land that has three heritage trees that you are prohibited from cutting down. You know, because if we are stewards of the land and we believe that this tree was here for 200 years and we want it to be here for the rest of its life, then just because you just bought this land doesn't mean that you get to cut it down. So that might be a whole other conversation. But that's true protection, not just of a tree, but of an ecosystem that we have to think that way nowadays. Not just what a tree does for me, but what it does for us and future generations and the whole ecosystem and habitat that we're trying to take care of. So, you know, I, you know, I could talk forever about that. But <laughs> I think heritage tree is a great way to start permanent yes. protection of trees and not yes. just a greater fine because a lot of people, it doesn't deter them at all. I, I mean, I can certainly write, and maybe that's the thing that we bring back to the next meeting, the list of recommendations, and we'll draft it based off of all the directional hearing tonight, and we bring that back and we hand it off to the PCCBA, here's what we're thinking. But I, I know the heritage tree, that is, that is on their docket, for sure. Great. So to, the, great to, to the extent that some trees are totally taboo, I don't know. But you know, I, I, the village wasn't there when the village wrote its most recent tree regulations whenever it was 15 years ago. Yes. Okay, there's well, some. I know the work of the Garden Club and the Wola and the library. It, there's so much energy around natives and downtown and all that. But anyway, I had a group of really pissed off neighbors. <laughs> People have <laughs> taken taken this in, so I think it's good if our Facebook our was all of flutter this past weekend. Uh, it reflects. Yeah, on that very subject. Okay. All right, next up is the village staff report. Uh, can I just make a comment? Oh, uh, sure. Come on up. So you thought I was here for the review. <laughs> <laughs> Putting my other hat on. I'm also, I started a group called the um, Growing Native Lake Bluff. And I know Mickey Collins has been here. It's all based on Doug Talley. You know that. I've presented to you before. But I just wanted to, to emphasize, I think you guys are doing the right thing. Thank you so much. And the term keystone species, I, I would like, I would love to see in an ordinance that you have a goal that you will plant X number percentage, that you, you'll have no less than 70% native. Like when you plant your trees, that you're gonna shoot for a target to try to ensure that you're using the natives. Cause you can have them, but if somebody gets a deal on another tree that's cheap and we, you know, it, um, availability can be tough. The other thing I think I just put in your ear is that you talked about the birds migrating. It's so true. The birds migrate. They don't care as much about the trees. What really cares about the trees are the bugs. And 
the bugs is what feeds our birds. So as I say, if you don't, you know, if you want to have birds, you've got to have the bugs. And the bugs have to have the native trees, and the bugs are not migrating. And that's one of the reasons that you say, okay, we can try some southern trees, but let's not go crazy and just put them all in. So something to consider. Um, two more things real quick. Um, the smaller the tree, the faster it acclimates. The less you have to water it and maintain it. You have neighbors who don't want to do this work. Um, sometimes a smaller tree is better. Yeah, it takes a couple years, but as Doug Callum will say, in 10 years you won't be able to tell the difference. So food for thought, they're also a lot cheaper. Um, and the other thing is, is when you go to a non-native tree, a lot of the nurseries, and I was talking to Possibility Place, who does only natives, um, a lot of trees use what they, what I, I'm going to use the term neonics. Mm, yeah. um, it's not just neonics, there's a whole class of them, but that gets into the DNA of the plant and that will kill the pollinators. So when you put in a plant that has this in it and you have pollinators eating on it, that you're thinking you have a good native tree, you could be killing your pollinators. So that, I don't know how you work that in, but I just. <laughs> So Sue, let me ask you just to clarify. So a neonicotinoid is used as a... Well, you know, it's used all over the place in like agriculture, et cetera, but I'm told that they're using pesticides. They use it in pesticides so that when they, especially when they take trees across state lines, there are certain bugs they don't want to cross state lines. So they'll use these neonics, and these get actually into the DNA of the tree, and it stays there. It stays in the tree, it stays in the acorn, it stays in the flower, in the next generation, in the next generation, and it does kill the pollinators. It's one of the reasons for the colony collapse. Um, so it, it is significant. Um, if you go to natives, most, I, I don't know of any native places locally that you buy trees that, have, that use them. They're very careful not to, but another thing to consider, but so, um, I just wanted to say that, small, and of course, keystone species, oak, cherry, willow. Thank you. <laughs> you. Seven. Yeah, so tomorrow, just as an update, we are getting our existing conditions report uh, presented at the PCZBA, and that'll that's as part of the comp plan update. So it'll just go through kind of um, what the conditions are that they'll be basing the rest of the recommendations and the actual comprehensive land use plan update on. So uh, that's tomorrow at 6 p.m. before a regular PCZBA meeting if anyone's interested in checking that out. Um, we're hoping to possibly have some of our Zoom stuff back up, but there will be a presentation similar today, so you'll at least be able to follow through. And the slides are in the packet on the website already. If you're not available for that, and just want to take a look at what's being presented. Yeah. Okay, anything else from the village? <coughs> um, other than that, we're just going through with our comp plan update, so uh, mm -hmm. definitely more to come with that. Great. Claire, um, I have a question. Yep. There are things with the Bird City USA application. Yeah, so uh, we had a summer intern that worked remotely that put together a draft of that, so Great. now it's kind of getting into more of the details and getting ready for um, Submittal. One of the there's been some things where we've had to ask for clarifications. For instance, they uh, require us to have an event for Migratory Bird Day, and so we were trying to get some specifics on what that may or may not include. Yeah, so um, just kind of pinning down the specifics. It's also difficult because the Birds City Illinois group is, I believe, mostly volunteer. And so uh, there was a little bit of difficulty kind of getting into the application at first. So that um, set us back a little bit, but we're uh, ready to move forward with that, hopefully Great. within the next few months. And what we're thinking about the, the celebration is actually having a speaker come to this group to be a greater community education. Some of the communities have done like, we'll do a, a, a presentation in a park or somewhere on a Saturday morning or something. Um, and we thought 
benefits of doing it at this venue is one, it's open, it's televised, you can watch it you know, afterwards, after the fact, and so that it, it gives, it has a lot more um, um, legs long term by doing it that way, doing just doing a one off, you know. So that's what likely we'll present and see if, we can, if that will be acceptable to, to them, but that's what we're thinking. That's great. I bet Lola would be willing to host a bird walk that, you know. Dress is your favorite migratory bird, Dad. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. Yeah. That could be awesome. Uh, members report, anything anyone wants to add? You know, I do have a question getting back to the ban on gas leak blowers that's going to come to an end very soon. Are we going to do any uh, debrief? You know, with with us, with the village, you know, it was so important. We had such great turnout when our uh, residents asked us to, you know, put this man in place. And I would love the opportunity to get people's feedback about how. Or, they, or has the village gotten feedback? But yes. you know, when it's done, <laughs> <laughs> it would be nice to hear it, to share it, to yeah. you know, do you know, based on experience now and feedback. What's the next step for us? You know, because a lot of people ask me, well, why do you still allow the gas, you know, this and the gas that? I mean, it's only one thing, why don't you go after more? So that's one approach. Another thing I noticed is that it's really quiet. Mm -hmm. And I had no idea how noisy it was until you hear those outliers who are using their gas leak blowers and you think, man, that's loud. So, I think it was a great first step to say, let's ban electrics from the 15th of May to the end of September. I think that's a great toehold, but I think we can take it a step further if we get real information from our residents about what they liked or didn't like about it. So. Our recollection was that, that uh, the check-in was gonna happen in about 24 months. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, right away? No. no. Okay. But generally speaking, I'll just start making notes then. <laughs> uh, generally speaking, the feedback the village received has been very positive. Good. So, as you might say, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I walk five miles every morning, part of Lake Forest, part of Lake Bluff, and it's such an abrupt, tr painful transition <laughs> to leave Lake Bluff and enter Lake Forest. It's like this you know, huge noise. It's got to be offense, offense to the senses. Yes, yes. Um, I've seen the assault. Uh, the assault. Landscape, thank you. The landscape companies seem like they've adapted. I mean, they've got these uh, uh, battery-powered backpack ones now, um, and I think they're. It, it's going to be interesting to see in, in September 30th if it gets all fired back up. <laughs> they pull the mm -hmm. gas ones back out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 right. But you're exactly right in that. You know, I think the village when they went into this was, you know, this, we weren't the first ones to this part, right? Yeah, Penaca and Evanston, like all of them had that same regulation of books, so people were already geared up for it, and so it made our transition that much easier. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, we've got fall and next spring cleanup, so let's see what data we get. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else from the members? Okay, uh, chair report. I have some good news to announce. So uh, this is from Lake Forest. A dozen students at high schools in Lake Forest were named semifinalists for the 2024 National Merit Scholarships. They included six from Lake Forest High School. And one of those people is right here on our board, Alexa Richard. Thank you. So, um, uh, the 12, uh, 12 local scholars were among more than 16,000 high school students who qualified from across the country based on the result of their preliminary SAT test they took last year uh, and uh, uh, are graduating seniors. I understand there's one last step you need to go through. Yeah, so there's a big application with an essay and submitting alternate scores um, and then about 50% of the uh, 16,000 semifinalists get a pretty big scholarship, so it's an exciting opportunity. Thank okay. you. Fingers crossed. Yeah, Fingers crossed. Doing it. Congratulations. Let us know if we can do anything. Yes. Like, like, can we write your essay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah there we go. So yeah, I Yes. Oh. <laughs> I doubt. <laughs> yeah, we need it. Okay. Congrats. Um, that
then can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion. Motion to adjourn. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.